every day. Hospitals, EMS services, and lay people across the globe use Zoll products to save lives. So thank you very much. Uh, it's indeed an honour and a privilege to be here today. Um, thank you to um, the distinguished um, guests that have spoken already today. This is a very um, austere sort of uh, meeting. And I, I want to introduce um, a, a concept that's been um, put forward to us by um, this conference, and that is to have a uh, memorial lecture to Ian Jacobs, and that'll be presented by uh, Jerry Nolan, and I'll speak about that in a minute. Ian Jacobs, now, Ian Jacobs was a, um, a, an amazing person. He uh, died, unfortunately, not only unexpectedly, but very prematurely uh, at the end of 2014. Why was someone like that so revered? Well, he has a small public life, but the reality is he has a very large um, contribution that he's made over the years. His professional roles include um, a large number of roles within uh, Australia itself, but in particular he has training both as a nurse, as a paramedic, as an educator and, of course, as a scientist. He's contributed um, enormously to St John Ambulance over his lifetime, uh, to the point that he was awarded the most distinguished officer of the Order of St John. He was a, a very media savvy person. Really, Ian's skills were <laughs> as a communicator and as a communicator in formal events or just as a communicator from a teaching point of view or even as a listening point of view. Uh, and that was one of the key things. He was really a facilitator. Um, he put, um, he, he put Austra Australia uh, on the map to a degree with regard to the international community and that, that was his, his bigger extended family, the international community that we have. Um, he would lead the Australian contingent uh, around the world um, and he was indeed a resuscitation giant. And this culminated in a number of uh, final uh, things, including his chairmanship of the Australian Resuscitation Council since 2000 and his co-chair of ILCOR uh, since 2011. Uh, and as the co-chair of ILCOR, of course, driving the um, CoStar process, uh, the consensus on science and treatment recommendation, as mentioned before, that was published last year. His commitment to research was an enormous commitment, uh, including supervising over 20 postgraduate researchers. Uh, and he was a passionate supporter of those people and their research. Of course, he had his lovely wife, uh, Judith, who is uh, here today to be able to share this with her, with us. Um, Judith was one of the many contributors to the International Liaison Committee on Resuscitation. And uh, some people argue that um, <laughs> his sort of sidekick, um, which uh, slides are being censored at the moment, um, <laughs> His uh, sidekick and someone that had worked with him for many, many years, Ilkor rep with him for 17 years and uh, deputy chair as he was chair for 14 years. Um, yeah, there are some similarities, Australian accent, <laughs> beard, whatever. But Ian, Ian was a, a great, he really was a great. Uh, he will be long remembered for the contributions that he's made and he was cut down in his prime. Um, I think for a long time the legacy of Ian will be there um, and that's evidenced by a number of things. Uh, for example, on the day of his funeral, I was notified of this publication that came through and the continues uh, publications in his name, even since he's died, and international awards, including this one by the Resuscitation uh, Science Group uh, in the American Heart Association. Um, he did get published in Lancet. It was an obituary. He's disappointed to only be published in Lancet as an obituary, but, um, but uh, what more can we say? Ian... Um, <laughs> There are many memories of you, some of them permanent, indelibly imprinted on us, and others we recognise that you're there watching us in the background. So um, thank you, Ian. But more importantly for today, I do want to introduce Jerry Nolan. Now, Professor Jerry Nolan is again a um, friend, a colleague, uh, and uh, also a giant in resuscitation. And his current roles as seen there, Professor of Resuscitation Medicine at University of Bristol, uh, Editor-in-Chief of Resuscitation, uh, Chairman of uh, UK Cardiac Arrest Audit Steering Group, Vice Chairman of the ERC, and of course also immediate uh, past co-chairman and colleague of, of Ian. So I'll hand over now to uh, Jerry Nolan.
Peter, thank you very much for that kind introduction. Um, Dr. Lam Pin Min, ladies and gentlemen, it's an enormous pleasure to uh, have this invitation to Singapore. It's my first visit to this country. What I've seen so far, it's a beautiful place. I hope to be able to return one day with a, a little bit more leisure time. Um, thank you to uh, the SEMS organizing committee uh, for really giving this huge honor uh, of giving this Ian Jacobs Memorial Lecture. Um, We've already heard from Peter about Ian's contributions to resuscitation. Uh, they were absolutely huge. But Ian was personally a, a great friend to me and was with me through, really through most of my time with ILCOR. We shared many, many happy moments together. Serious work at times, but also some, some really very, very great social occasions. So the title of my presentation is all about the top 10 strategies for improving survival from out of hospital cardiac arrest. And it's a convenient title because I had the pleasure of publishing this very short paper in intensive care medicine with my colleagues Alan Cario and Shettle Sunder just a few months ago. And so that's giving me really the structure for this presentation to you today. And I think it's probably going to serve very well as just an, an opener to give you some flavor of what is to come in the rest of these two days of this conference. And you can see down the, the side of this slide uh, the sort of 10 things that the three of us thought were the major contributors to improving survival from out-of-hospital cardiac arrest. And it covers, of course, quite a wide area. The one I want to start with, though, has already been highlighted beautifully by Dr. Lamb, and that is this whole issue of bystander CPR. And I think an important point that I want to make is that perhaps these, those strategies that have the uh, highest impact in terms of survival may be those that are simplest and less expensive to deliver than some of the more clever stuff that will come later on in the presentation. So we've got lots of data that I can show you in terms of showing that we are improving survival rates from out-of-hospital cardiac arrest. These data happen to come from Copenhagen, from the Danish Cardiac Arrest Registry, and you can see um, here uh, if you take the center two lines, and these are 30-day and one-year survival, uh, significant increase in overall survival, survival from, from all cardiac arrest rhythms. But look at the increase in survival from the shockable rhythms here. Quite substantial. And when you drill down in this registry and try and work out why that might be, top of the list has got to be the improvement in the rates of bystander CPR, as you can see on the slide there. And they did that with a number of strategies from which I think we can all learn. One of the things they did was to make resuscitation training mandatory in schools, something which I have to say disappointing in the UK, we still have not achieved despite massive efforts, but I think that's an important starter. Perhaps more novel and even more interesting is the fact that they insist on people taking resuscitation courses before they're allowed to pass their driving test, before they receive their driving license. So two interesting ways of trying to encourage people to learn CPR. Once you've got people who have been taught CPR, of course, the key thing is to be able to get them to the scene of a cardiac arrest. And this is where perhaps we can use technology using, for example, mobile phones and actually using those to locate uh, volunteers who have previously signed up to such programs that have been trained in CPR, and they can be dispatched to the scene of a cardiac arrest, thus reducing that time, that downtime for that victim. And this was a, a really important study, actually. This one comes from Sweden, so it's another Scandinavian country. Um, but it, this, these are technologies that can be applied elsewhere as well. As well. And they've shown in this randomized controlled trial um, that by dispatching such bystanders using this mobile phone technology, they can improve the rate of bystander CPR from 48% to 62%. And again, I emphasize that's important, this study, because it is a randomized controlled trial. These were not just simply observational data. Another way we can do it, and again, this has been addressed importantly by Dr. Lamb in his presentation to us this morning, is perhaps by increasing overall the number of people who are trained in CPR by simply making it simple. Simplifying it means more people are prepared to do it. So by teaching compression-only CPR, 
we can get vastly more n numbers of the public trained. These data are from the All Japan Registry, and I think they're important for showing us a number of things. We can see it's about eight years altogether. This gives us the overall increase in the incidence of bystander CPR, but the important bit is the light-colored columns here, which represent the increase in compression-only CPR. And you can see one of the ways they did that in Japan was since 2006, they've changed the dispatcher-assisted CPR from conventional CPR to compression only. And we've just heard the same thing, I gather, has been done in Singapore. So this, I think, is really important. And what, it will, what we can then see, in fact, from these Japanese data here, is an increase in um, one-month uh, survival rates. If you compare either compression only or conventional CPR, clearly much higher survival rates than if there's no CPR at all. So those are important points. And we can pull that out down here. When you compare compression only and conventional, you adjust those data and compare with no CPR. These are pretty well roughly equivalent, actually. So although there's slightly higher effect from conventional CPR, there's not a lot in it. And importantly, when you look at these data another way, and I think this is perhaps the most powerful slide, if you look at it in terms of the number of lives saved per 10 million population, so these are lives saved with good neurological outcome, we can see, again in this Japanese data, over this eight-year period, big increase in overall survival rates, but this is mainly contributed by, in the red line here, those survivors that have been produced from compression-only CPR. So in terms of absolute numbers, compression-only CPR makes a lot of sense. So I think that's clearly the way to go. The second thing I want to address is the issue of AEDs and public access defibrillation programs. I took this slide in a visit to, uh, to Tokyo and it, um, it shows a number of things. Interesting, in Japan, they have a huge public access program, uh, public access defibrillator program. They have a tendency to bury the AEDs in these vending machines, which is novel in a way because it's sort of encouraging people to drink lots of sugary drinks, get lots of ischemic heart disease, and then they can treat themselves when they have their cardiac arrest. So, uh, um, so there's a sort of plus and minus, I think, to, to that approach. But seriously, though, if we look again at some, some other Japanese data, and I've extracted these from a paper that was looking at trends over a number of years, but I've taken data from 2005 and 2012. Just look at the sales of public access defibrillators from 11,000 to 365,000, a massive increase in public access defibrillators. And if you look just at this data here, so defibrillation by bystanders only, so where a bystander has used the defibrillator, very few in 2005, big increase. It's still a low number in proportion to the overall number of cardiac arrests, but relatively speaking, quite, quite a big increase. And it's important because these are quite complex data, but I've summarized the most important one at the bottom here, which is when you risk adjust for all sorts of variables. If you look at the, the odds ratio of survival here and compare bystander defibrillation compared with defibrillation undertaken by EMS, where inevitably there's a bit of a delay, you can see an odds ratio of over two. So if you can get bystanders to do this, they can potentially produce really good and high survival rates. So I think that's an important message. And the Dutch have come out with, I think, a really nice way of trying to increase the time, or reduce the time that AEDs are delivered at the, at the side of a, of a victim of cardiac arrest. And again, it's by using mobile phone technology, this time using text messages, going out to, to volunteers who are trained. Instead of just sending them to the scene of a cardiac arrest, they can work out whether these volunteers happen to be within 500 meters of a defibrillator, of an AED. And if they are, the text message will tell them to go to the AED first, pick that up, and then take it to the scene of the cardiac arrest. So it's a really clever way of delivering AEDs there quickly. Third strategy, good quality ALS. Now, I found this, in fact, quite difficult to be able to show you high quality data to show that good quality ALS diff uh, makes a difference. And I think the challenge here is that we need to produce such high quality data to really tell us, for example, what is the optimal airway management techniques? Should we be using mechanical devices? And if so, how and when? What about drugs? What drugs should we be using? How and when? It's incredible that we really don't know the answers to any of these. 
But I think if we're going to improve survival from out-of-hospital cardiac arrest, we need to find out just what impact those interventions are making. The fourth one I wanted to mention was monitoring, and I think this is really an area that's right at the cutting edge now, perhaps in some cases more useful for in-hospital than out-of-hospital cardiac arrest, but for some of these, they certainly have a role out of hospital. Capnography is perhaps the one that's, that's most practical right now, so it's being implemented, implemented worldwide. There are a number of advantages to capnography. First of all, it will hopefully give us an indication if a patient has been intubated and that tube is in the wrong place, it's a good way of picking that up very, very quickly, so reducing the risk of unrecognized esophageal intubation. We now recognize that the uh, value of end tidal CO2 during cardiac arrest is associated with, to some extent, quality of CPR. So the better our, our chest compressions, the higher the CO2 values will be. And the final thing it can do is give us a very early indication of return of spontaneous circulation. We know, from, certainly from these data, that end tidal CO2 values, which are on this scale here, correlate or associate very well with depth of compression. And this is from a lot, this is obviously observational data from a large number of patients. And we know that that association holds true across a whole range of compression rates, which is what those different colored lines are. What we have yet to prove is that by changing the way that we deliver CPR, improving our chest compression depth, for example, using that as a target, that we can then improve survival. We haven't shown that yet, but I think that that's going to come hopefully fairly soon. The other thing we can use is use other physiological targets. So if we happen to have an arterial line in a patient, perhaps less likely out of hospital, more likely in hospital, and indeed if we have a CVP line as well, we can target coronary perfusion pressure. And there's some animal data suggesting that that actually may well improve survival, at least in the short term, compared with just targeting a set fixed compression depth. We might be able to use arterial diastolic pressure and use that as a target for patients that have got arterial lines. And as I've said, we could potentially use end tidal CO2 values. And those figures and numbers up on that slide were derived from a sort of consensus published by the American Heart Association. Unfortunately, I have to say, yet, yeah, we don't have really high quality data to prove that those particular targets change survival. That's the information that we're getting at the moment, but that's the recommendations based on expert consensus. A technique which is, right, is evolving right now, it's not ready for kind of routine clinical practice by any means, but I think it's very interesting, and that's cerebral oxygenation. And certainly these data, I'm showing you these because these are pre-hospital data. They come from Belgium. 49 patients with cerebral oximetry monitored during out-of-hospital cardiac arrest. And you can see that if you divide the patients to, into those that get return of spontaneous circulation, the circles here, com compared with those that don't, you get a significantly higher rise in regional oxygenation in those that get ROSC. Now that doesn't tell us that necessarily we can use that as a target yet and improve survival, but that would be the goal. If we can show that we can reliably use regional cerebral oxygenation as a target, improve our CPR to get a better value of regional oxygenation and improve survival, then it may be of use even for out-of-hospital cardiac arrest. Advanced therapies. Well, there's a, there's a variety of techniques out there. Probably top of the list would be extracorporeal CPR or eCPR. And it is being used for out-of-hospital cardiac arrest. And certainly in some parts of the world, particularly in France, where this picture has been taken, this is the uh, French SAMU um, in action, putting a patient on eCPR in the Louvre in Paris, which I'm sure would have upset quite a few of these people here protecting the paintings, because it's a bit of a messy process. Um, it's fair to say at the moment the survival rates reported by our French colleagues are not that high for this practice. But there may be a role for eCPR, perhaps uh, for out-of-hospital cardiac arrest, but using it in conjunction with other techniques to get these patients into hospital early and put them onto eCPR in the emergency department. And that's the kind of thought processes behind this CHEER trial, which was just a feasibility study from Melbourne, Australia. Um, it's a small study. 26 patients altogether, but, and it's combining both out-of-hospital and in-hospital cardiac arrest. 
But the key strategy from this is that the patients are highly selected, so there'll be patients with short downtimes, relatively young and in shockable rhythms, and they'll get transported in cardiac arrest using Autopulse, one of the mechanical uh, CPR devices, into the emergency department and then put on ECMO there. And, and it just shows in this feasibility trial that they can get pretty reasonable survival rates so with five patients here surviving out of the 11 described in that of hospital group. Clearly a lot more work needs to be done on this. Clearly this is not an inexpensive option. This is an expensive option with limited availability depending on which hospitals are, are out there. But it's, it's certainly a strategy for potentially improving survival from out of hospital cardiac arrest. So our next one is post-resuscitation care. This is potentially a huge topic, and it's, it's been really rapidly evolving. There's been a lot of data in post-resuscitation care over the last few years. We now, this is the, and I know you can't see the details of this, so I'm going to break it down a little bit for you in a moment, but we now have a post-resuscitation care algorithm. I know that the American Heart Association, I think, had an algorithm in 2010 for post-resuscitation care, if I'm correct, but now we've got one for the Europeans as well. And I think the importance of this is it's really trying to get some structure and standardization to what we do in the post-resuscitation period. Because we know that what we do at that stage, after return of spontaneous circulation, can make a difference to the quality of outcome. One of the things I'm quite proud about that came out of Europe uh, this year was a collaboration in our post-resuscitation care guidelines, collaboration between the European Resuscitation Council and the European Society of Intensive Care Medicine. And the reason I think that's really important is that by having that collaboration and getting the critical care community on board with, gui with resuscitation guidelines, we are much more likely to be effective in its implementation. In other words, the critical care community, if they've got buy into this, they've been involved with it, they're much more likely to apply it. So I really hope we make progress there. One of the areas we're going to hear a lot more about, and I think Professor Kern is going to be covering some of this later, is the whole concept of um, much more rapid and early coronary angiography and PCI where appropriate in those out-of-hospital cardiac arrests that are likely to be of cardiac cause. And certainly this is the sort of center section of our post-resuscitation care guideline. And you can see it's very, very simple in this algorithm. There's a lot of supporting text that goes with this. But in essence, what we're suggesting here, if there is ST elevation on the ECG, then it should be pretty clear cut. These people will need urgent angiography. But much more importantly, even if there is not ST elevation on the ECG, we're emphasizing the importance of discussion with our interventional cardiology colleagues because a number of those patients may well be very suitable for early angiography, possibly PCI as well. And Professor Kern will cover that later on. So that's an important part of post-resuscitation care that can make a difference to survival. There are obviously a lot of other interventions that I don't have time to cover in this presentation, but you'll hear more about those as the conference goes on. Certainly, for example, seizure control. There's a lot of data out there supporting that. And of course, at the top of that slide here, controlled or targeted temperature management really important still. We know that there is some controversy about what target temperature we should use. Should it be 33 degrees? Should it be 36 degrees? But the strong message out there still is that we should be using some form of targeted temperature management to at least prevent hypothermia. And so now many ICUs, even if they choose not to use 33, should at least be using controlled temperature at 36 degrees for 24 hours at least. And that is something else which is clearly contributing to improved outcomes from cardiac arrest. The next topic that I want to cover is also really important, and it's, it's a huge topic. But I think it has an enormous potential for improving survival from out-of-hospital cardiac arrest. And that is the whole concept of prognostication. I think in the past, I have to say particularly in the part of the world that I come from, in Europe particularly, we were probably withdrawing from patients way too early in critical care. So we were taking comatose post-resuscitation patients as early as 24 hours often and deciding that based on their clinical examination that they had no realistic chance of, of a good quality recovery. And I'm sure that withdrawals in many cases were premature 
and that we were actually losing patients who potentially could have survived and survived neurologically intact. So we've learned a lot now. We recognize that we need to be undertaking multimodal techniques for deciding to, to when we are going to or if we're going to withdraw care from patients. We've got guidelines. Again, in this case, these are the European ones, a collaboration between the European Society of Intensive Care Medicine and the European Resuscitation Council. And I don't have time to go into the details of all of these, but there are two very, very important principles. One is that we are now delaying such decisions until at least 72 hours after return of spontaneous circulation, at least 72 hours, often much longer. And then in these patients, we're using a combination of these things, clinical examination, electrophysiology, the use of biomarkers and imaging, using that combination to try and get as much information as we can about the patient's prospects for making a good recovery. And if, based on that information, those prospects are very poor indeed, then it may be an entirely reasonable thing to do, at least within our culture, to withdraw care at that stage. I know that's a controversial area, but it's important, I think, that we get that right. Again, we have an algorithm for this. This happens to be the European one. I appreciate it's a complex algorithm. You probably can't see a lot of the detail on that. But it's the principles that are really important. And patients really only enter this algorithm if they're unconscious and either no response or an extensive response to a painful stimulus. So with a motor score, in other words, of one or two. And they're either going to be satisfying these criteria, so no pupil or, and no corneal ref reflexes, or absent N20s on somatosensory evoked potentials. If they fulfill that criteria, then a poor outcome is very likely indeed. The trouble is the vast majority of patients who ultimately are going to have a poor outcome will not satisfy those criteria. And so the majority will have to come down here and satisfy a combination of at least two of those investigations there, as you can see. So it's, it is complex, but it's important that we spend time and take things very, very carefully. And if there's doubt, and as you can see at the bottom, observe, reevaluate, observe, reevaluate, and give these patients time to recover. An area which I think is really at the cutting edge now, and something which we really need to improve a lot, is the whole concept of active rehabilitation of survivors of cardiac arrest. We know from our work in traumatic brain injury and stroke, for example, that aggressive early rehabilitation can really improve outcome in such patients. And yet in cardiac arrest, they've often been just left to their own devices with no real support at all. We now have people like Veronique Moulart who are publishing quite a lot on this area and showing that active interventions, often from the nurses actually, will improve outcome in such patients. And you can see this is actually um, a, a really a controlled trial showing back to work at three months is significantly improved with active and aggressive rehabilitation. So that's an important message. I want to talk about registries, and these are really important. We've been talking a lot about this um, in the last two days of the ILCOR meeting. And I've already shown, if you think about it, the slides that I've shown already, we've already heard from Jap the All Japan Registry. We've got the registry in the Danish registry. There's a, there's a lot of them out there. Um, but of course, importantly, we've got PAROS. And I know Marcus Ong is here in the audience. Um, very, very useful data from seven countries from this region of the world. And I think it's important for a number of reasons. First of all, it gives us some baseline. It tells us what is actually going on out there right now. But really important, these registries allow us to track outcomes. So if we make changes to resuscitation interventions, then we can actually see the impact of those without necessarily having to do randomized controlled trials. What can we learn from this study? This was relatively recent data, um, 66,000 cases or so from a three-year period. And what we can see from these seven countries here, if you look at the front columns, and this is um, survival to discharge uh, for EMS-treated cardiac arrests, what we can see is quite wide variation in outcomes. I think it ranges from about 0.5% to 8.5%, so quite a wide range. And we need to drill down into why that is. 
And there will be a whole range of differences in those healthcare systems, which we can learn a lot from. And certainly, we can also show over time, and this is even more at home now, because this data is specifically to Singapore, although it comes from the Paros Registry as well. And you can see if you can compare um, a period of about 10 years or so ago with more recent data, we've already heard this figure from Dr. Lam this morning, actually, increase, a significant increase in bystander C CPR rates from 19.7 to 22.4 percent. And of course, you are seeing a significant increase in your survival rate, survival to discharge doubling from 1.6 to 3.2. And if you look at the Utstein group, so witnessed shockable rhythms, then again, quite a substantial increase, although the overall numbers are still quite low, so we still need to see more of these patients caught early enough to be actually to deal with shockable rhythms, quite a big increase in the, in the percentage of survivors. So really useful data. And the other thing that we can do with that, as shown from this study from Singapore, is you can start to look at some of the other variables here, some of these response times that could account for that improvement in survival rates. And I'm just going to pick out, for example, the time of ambulance arrival at scene. These are from the 10 years ago data for a period of time to the more recent period here. And you can see some of these times are just shifting just, just a little bit, but significantly down this scale here. So as you see those times shortening, you can associate those with better outcome. So really important data, and those sorts of data we should better capture from, from many regions of the world. The final strategy to try and improve out-of-hospital uh, survival rates is really trying to ramp up our research and trying to discover exactly what interventions uh, end up producing better survival rates. And what we're seeing now is a change, I think, from relatively small studies from which we really couldn't address um, the question that we were trying to sort out to much, much bigger studies, multi-center, in many cases multinational, to try and answer um, the research questions. Examples would include the Resuscitation Outcomes Consortium in North America. We've got the TTM investigators from, uh, from Europe. Many, many other examples as well. And clearly I could show you a lot of examples of ongoing research, but let's just pick out some. Ongoing at the moment, there's a big airways trial uh, going on in the UK. This is one that I'm involved with, hence I'm slightly in a biased way showing you this. But this hopefully will address the question of superglottic airways, or at least the eye gel versus tracheal intubation. It's a cluster randomized trial. 9,000 patients will be enrolled, and you can see we're about a third of the way through that trial already, and that should complete, we think, in about 2017. Now, interestingly, at the same time, just started in the United States, is this PART trial, which is again a cluster randomized trial, this time of the laryngeal tube versus tracheal intubation, uh, 3,000 patients, because they've got a slightly different endpoint than ours. But again, this is set to probably complete around about 2017, so there may be an opportunity to actually look at data from both of those studies. And hopefully it will address once and for all what is the best way of managing the airway for out-of-hospital arrest. Really exciting, a trial that I'm, I'm really looking forward to hearing the results of this. I understand from Laurie Morrison this is going to be presented on the 4th of April, and I hope that this will once and for all tell us whether we should indeed be using amiodarone, lidocaine, or none of those drugs in, uh, in VF and VT. So we'll wait and see the results of that. And then importantly, this study here, which chief investigator is Professor Perkins, who you've heard from this morning already. This is the Paramedic 2 trial. It's adrenaline versus placebo. And as you can see, again, it's a huge study, 8,000 patients. So that's the target enrollment. And you can see we're coming up to about 25% of those patients enrolled now. And I think this is a really important link to the subject of this presentation, because the person that really trailblazed the whole concept of really challenging uh, the data out there and asking the question, is there benefit or not from using adrenaline out of hospital cardiac arrest? The person that started that, of course, was Ian Jacobs. And he did a study in Australia to do this and came up against huge problems, huge problems with the media, around the ethics of such trials, lots and lots of challenges that meant that when his study was eventually finished, unfortunately, it was really quite underpowered because he simply couldn't recruit the number of patients he wanted to do. But the kind of lessons that Ian learned and his, and his team learned 
we, I guess, learnt from that ourselves so that when we also faced all sorts of media problems, we were ready for it and we had answers to them and we, we had sort of anticipated that and, and faced it head on, even to the extent of me being sacrificed to the media <laughs> on live British television in a debate with an ethicist on the ethics of such a randomised controlled trial, which was challenging to say the least. So that brings me to the summary. And those, I think, are the, the 10 strategies that hopefully can improve survival from out-of-hospital cardiac arrest. Huge amount that we've covered, but remember, you're going to hear a lot more in detail over the next two days, or probably most of those areas that I've, that I've addressed. And finally, I'd just like to close with some thought to Ian again, and we've already heard from Peter Morley, about Ian's contribution to resuscitation, absolutely huge. And I also want to give my personal thoughts uh, to Ian. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much indeed.